Great. Uh, without further ado, then, um, we will get started and dive in because we've got a lot to cover today. And I would be it would be a shame for us to have to skip over any of it. So um, welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us at the Year of Open Science uh, culminating conference uh, and this workshop session on aligning professional roles and incentives with open, reproducible and ethical research. I'm Errol Bennett. I'm a program manager at the Alan Turing Institute, also a member of the Turing Way team. Um, and I'm luckily, luckily stepping in for uh, Emma Croon today, who sadly can't be here to chair this session. Um, and we hope that she's on soon. We'd very much like to encourage folks who are on the webinar to participate in our shared notes taking document. Um, my colleague Ale will be sharing the link in the uh, webinar chat for you to uh, join, sign in and um, add your thoughts to uh, as the meeting goes on. Um, and yeah, just welcome everyone. Thank you very much for being here. We have an amazing set of panelists today to discuss this topic with, um, and I'll be asking them to introduce themselves fully during the session. But just to quickly kick off, there's a few slides on the Turing Way project, research infrastructure role and research infrastructure roles to set the scene for our discussion. So the Turing Way is an open science project on and community driven handbook on data science and research practices. We involve and support a diverse community to make data science research reproducible, ethical and collaborative for everyone to make these practices too easy not to do. The Turing Way project started with contributors who documented best practices, guidance and recommendations in chapters around improving the computational reproducibility aspects of data research. So this is topics such as open research, version control, licensing, data management, code testing and reviewing, continuous integration, etc. But the more the contributors wrote, the more they realized that there were other aspects to good research practices that needed to be shared too. To help people build out this foundational skill set, the project expanded to include four more guides in addition to the Guide for Reproducible Research, Project Design, Communication, Collaboration and Ethical Research. Finally, to ensure that a project like the Turing Way can uh, help support the development of other communities across open science and beyond, we also maintain a community handbook that compiles all the different processes and community practices uh, that we employ that could then be reused by others who are inspired. This intentional approach to community building has paid off with our community growing over the last five years to 450 contributors, 6,000 monthly users, over 25 core cool community members and over 12 projects building on our work out into new directions in different areas. My personal favorite metric is the thousands of downloads we've had of our images co-created by key community members and the illustration company Scriberia. These are used throughout this talk. You can see some of us have them as our background right now. And they're also all available for reuse online. And there's nothing we like more than spotting a Scriberia image in the wild in other people's presentations. We've seen our project and community grow in the last five years, and we're proud of that because we give, we intentionally build in a lot of um, participation mechanisms to help encourage community members to contribute to the guide, regardless of their experience of working with open source or the data science community, whether that's um, mentoring, training, templates, or other pathways. Um, we look for defining pathways that always require multiple people to support each other, so mentored contributions, um, and we deliberately create opportunities for people to maintain and improve resources, which could be as simple as fixing a typo or a broken link or a bug, or all the way through to creating new resources of their interest and collaborating with other people in the community to build uh, shared resources outside of the guides as well. Contributors are also those who share these resources, uh, review and update the existing chapters, and particularly translate them into languages that ensure accessibility to good data science practices for a global community, not just people who are able to speak English. Finally, we also encourage everyone to share best practices by highlighting what they've learned through their own work. Everyone has someone to share that. Beyond the guide and the community, uh, one way we are we apply our approach to establishing shared agency and best practices in the wider research space 
is recognizing and funding research infrastructure roles. People such as data stewards, bioinformaticians, data wranglers, project managers, software research software engineers, community managers, and others bring sophisticated technical and interpersonal skills to the teams they collaborate with, which enables them to achieve more than some of the individuals. Also, recognizing a wider range of outputs produced by these types of roles benefits the movement of open science by making it more appealing to spend time focusing on the quality and sustainability of research. Within the Turing Way and through the broader tools, practices and systems program at the Alan Turing Institute, we're championing both human and physical infrastructure, which is critical to the success of current and future research processes as a collaborative rather than individualized effort. You'll hear more from our panelists in just a second um, on this, but I just wanted to offer a very brief overview on their job titles. So we're all set to expand in the discussion. Starting off with probably the best well known uh, is research software engineers. This was coined 12 years ago now as a uh, job title name. Research software engineers are expert collaborators who bring their technical knowledge, data skills and data skills to the research projects. They promote software development best practices in research software through things such as version control, testing, documentation, and reusability. They also apply and teach a broad set of technical skills to both researchers and junior software engineers by being embedded in the research projects and acting as uh, expert contributors there. Next, squeezed into one slide for time, <laughs> um, we have a number of different roles um, who are also represented here today. First up are data stewards. This is an umbrella term for infrastructure support roles that involve the creation, management, and usage of research data, advising on everything from uh, how to make sensitive data accessible in an ethical way, to data management plans, to um, advise on metadata standards, anything to do with research data, the data stewards are able to advise on it. Next up, community managers. These are the glue that hold collaborations together. They empower a diverse set of stakeholders to co-create, maintain and sustain research processes and outputs that everyone can equitably benefit from. And then finally, my own role, uh, program and project managers uh, ensure that all the project cycles are executed on time, following agreed protocols and the, uh, making sure that projects and programs are not just in line with the Institute's policies, but also other funded policies and wider national and international uh, standards as well. So these research infrastructure roles are a new category of academic roles that we're investing in recognizing, professionalizing and developing, because not everyone who wants to stay in research wants or needs to become a professional, a principal investigator. And these roles need us all to advocate for them because they're still quite new in the collective consciousness around knowledge production in academia. As part of this, we've had several community members collaborate to develop a manifesto for rewarding and recognizing these roles. And Emma Karoon, who was sadly due, can't be here today, but was due to chair this panel, has been working to develop skills frameworks around key research infrastructure roles as a first step to providing development pathways for these careers um, into the future. We also recently launched a practitioner's hub where infrastructure roles at different organizations are convening to discuss the unique challenges and insights gleaned from bringing open research practices to their workplaces. None of this work is in a vacuum either. I'd also like to highlight the ongoing work of organizations such as the various research software engineering societies across the globe, the Center for Scientific Collaboration and Community Engagement, and the Hidden Ref, who are just three examples of numerous organizations who are all working on aspects of recognizing, professionalizing, and rewarding these critical roles. So with that whistle-stop tour through the um, Turing Way and a brief overview of research infrastructure roles, um, I'm delighted to be moving to a panel discussion um, with our panelists. Um, we are still waiting on a final panelist to um, join us, um, but for now, I'd like to go ahead and ask um, our panelists to introduce themselves and to respond on how they and their organizations have been advocating diversifying roles in research and data science. And Sandra, I'd be delighted to start with you, please. Thank you so much. I'm Sandra Gesing. I'm the executive director of the US Research Software Engineer Association. I'm in this role for four and a half months. <laughs> just started. We just got Sloan funding last year. Um, so USRSE started in 2018, 
and from about 20 members, we did grow to 2,300 members and we are really focused on to increase the diversity also in in USSE because we had our first conference, for example, last year in October. It was a big success. It is part of the program really to be welcoming, bringing the community together. And 70% in the room were male and white. So we know that we still have really to work on this. We have in our mission four topics. It's community building, advocacy, uh, offering resources and really diversity, equity and inclusion. We have a diversity, equity and inclusion working group. And looking at these topics, we have, for example, also a media club. Yesterday we looked or we discussed the topic um, of the movie Hidden Figures. I, I love that movie and Hidden Figures also shows the connection to us East, which has this hidden role and are so crucial for the research enterprise, but still don't have all the incentives. So, so we are working with different working groups. Working groups are big in USSE. It's, uh, we have an education and training working group, a mentorship working group, a leadership working group that helps aspiring leaders also to, to go the next stage. So there's a lot of going on where we hope that we can support this. And with having my first business plan for the next couple of years, one of the big missions is to reach out to minority serving institutions. And really because they often don't have the means to, to join research uh, proposals and all this. So we want to yeah, support that. That is the first overview and I hope I kept my two minutes. That's great. Thank you very much, um, Sandra. Lovely to uh, have you introduced. Um, Moving on now to Neil, uh, same question to you, opportunity for an introduction. Thank you, Eru. Um, yes, uh, I'm Neil Chu Hong. I'm director of the Software Sustainability Institute in the United Kingdom, and I'm professor of research software policy and practice at the University of Edinburgh. So the Software Sustainability Institute was established in 2010, and we very soon realized from, from that start that improving research also means improving and diversifying research teams. So as, uh, as you've mentioned, Ariel, uh, in 2012, um, at one of our workshops, we started that discussion around research software engineers and the role uh, that they play, recognizing that research isn't just done by individual hero researchers, but there's a whole set of different skills that are required to do research in the modern world. Um, however, kind of fast forward to a decade later, and what we were looking at was what were the barriers to more people entering these kinds of roles or for them to have careers in these um, in these different diverse roles. And so um, there's a paper that we published in 2021 looking at the diversity of the research software engineer population through um, the results and data produced by an international RSC survey that we coordinate. And, and we were comparing this against similar fields, so comparing it against IT professionals, comparing it against academia. And the thing that we noticed there was really that there were a lot of gaps still, um, that the research software engineering community was not as diverse as it could be, and that despite there being many different ways of getting into the career, uh, there were still some fairly traditional pathways that perhaps led to there being um, some some barriers being put in place for more people picking up these sorts of roles. Um, so um, what we're trying to do about it, uh, we, we're running a fellowship program that's now been going over uh, over 10 years as well, which is supporting people in many different roles and organizations and backgrounds to advocate for the skills and experience needed for open research. Um, We've started running workshops in different languages because even though we're a UK based organization, we've recognized that even within the UK, English is not the first language of many researchers. Um, and we've um, been uh, facilitating development of things like Hidden Ref, which is a competition that was um, produced uh, almost in, in kind of opposition to the way that research is assessed in the UK to make sure that all the different outputs and roles that play a part in research are recognised and rewarded. Um, but looking forward, I think our big challenges coming up, which we'll be discussing a little bit more in this panel, are around training and career development opportunities. 
because if we really do want to sort of diversify all of these roles that are uh, supporting good research and good data science, we need to be able to give as many people the opportunity to have a career in them. So thanks very much. I'll pass you back to you. Great. Thank you very much, Neil. Look forward to hearing more on that later as well. Um, and then our final panellist currently in the room, Esther, please introduce yourself. Thank you, Ariel. Uh, so my name is Esther Plomp, and my main role is being a data steward at the Delft University of Technology, Faculty of Applied Sciences in the Netherlands. And I've been a data steward since 2018. And at my faculty, I am the dedicated person for any questions regarding research data management and open science. And I think that having this expertise on um, these areas is very beneficial for the faculty and the researchers there, uh, because it really lowers the barrier for people to get in touch, uh, especially if you're situated in the same building. It really helps for people to just come and find you. And I think this saves people a lot of time um, because they don't have to figure everything out themselves. And I also think my role retra retains some um, institutional expertise at the faculty level instead of having this type of knowledge um, embedded centrally where it's a bit further away and it might be less applicable. Um, not only am I performing this role, I also like to advocate for including these types of roles uh, in a more holistic way in the research uh, ecosystem. And so, for example, um, Ariel, you already mentioned the publication, uh, the Manifesto for Rewarding and Recognizing Team Infrastructure Roles, uh, of which I was a part, as well as Ariel herself as well. And also, where possible, I try to address the barrier that we currently have uh, between research and supporting staff at Dutch universities, but probably also outside of the Netherlands. But because I'm based in the Netherlands, uh, I primarily try to address that barrier there. And that's me. Great. Thanks very much, Esther. Um, it looks as though Joseph's not quite able to join us just yet. So we'll have him um, uh, introduce himself when he's able to get in. He's got some technical difficulties at the moment, unfortunately. But in the interest of time, I'm going to move on to our first question. Um, this is going, we're going to ask this to Neil first. Um, can you share how these professions, particularly research software engineers, play an important role in adopting and integrating open, reproducible and ethical research practices into technology and data science projects? Yeah, thanks. And it's a great question. I, I think one of the things that we've seen um, from the, the sort of data around the research community is that nowadays research is more or less completely dependent on software and on data. Um, when you see the results coming in from the UK, the US and other countries, it's around 80% of research that could not be done without access to specialist research software. And I think it's similar numbers in terms of uh, the access to data sets. And, and in the last few years, things like the COVID pandemic have really shown the, the benefits to, to research of being able to share data and to analyze it using software. Um, and allied to that, a lot of researchers write code, but most of them are self-taught. So we have this, this kind of gap that's created where almost all of research is dependent on software and data, but the people who are the primary drivers of the research are not necessarily professionally trained in either um, in either software development or data management. And so particularly for research software engineers, I think they play a really important role in improving the reproducibility and the transparency of research because they let um, other researchers be able to inspect, to reuse the software, uh, and for it to be something where we are not all trying to do the same thing separately, but we are starting to try and come together. And instead, each research group, each research team concentrates on the one part that is their unique novel um, place in the in the overall research program. Some of that is also coming about by the increasing use of, of kind of common software platforms. So we see that for things like R. Um, where we've got uh, things like our open side doing curation uh, and increasingly in the in the use of lots of different very highly optimized libraries 
And research software engineers have the part to play there, both in developing and maintaining these different scientific and research um, computing libraries, and in also helping researchers understand um, within a research team what the best uh, tools and resources to use are. Um, but I, I guess I'll just finish off and say the really interesting thing now that we've been going for 10 years in the research software engineering movement, or 12 now, is that the role is changing and has always been changing. And I think as we go forward into the next 10 years, uh, the role of a research software engineering and research will change as well, um, with an increased emphasis, not necessarily on creating the code, but on helping researchers prove the correctness and the robustness of the work that they're doing. Um, uh, I, I know that some people have been at the AI UK summit recently, and one of the really intriguing things is that we're at an inflection point for the ability of researchers to use assistants um, that help them generate code. And so I think the role of an RSE is no longer um, going to be to produce that code, but it's going to be to make sure that that code is correct. So um, look forward to seeing how that, that plays out. Great, thank you very much, Neil. Um, I'd like to extend this question over to Esther as well, uh, particularly thinking about data stewards, what's their role in open, ethical, reproducible science practices? Thanks. Yeah, so as I mentioned, um, um, being based at my institute, I can really help lowering barriers for other researchers um, to share their research materials or to improve their research practices so that their research becomes more reproducible. Um, and the same thing goes for my own discipline. So I am uh, within isotope archaeology um, as a trained researcher. And being at the same institute uh, as people or being within the same discipline uh, really increases uh, the levels of trust that people have when you provide advice, um, or at least that is what I see. Uh, and that helps them navigating their way uh, through everything, open science and reproducibility, et cetera, uh, because there are a lot of materials out there. Uh, but if you do not know for which keywords to find them, it can be, uh, quite a field to navigate your way through. And so as an expert in data management and also open science requirements, um, I'm basically the navigator that takes researchers through funding requirements. Um, and um, well, for example, uh, whenever uh, a larger research project needs to set up a data management plan, uh, I make sure that uh, the discussions around this are not just that we fill out the data management plan because the funder requires it, and then we have the checkbox filled for the deliverable, um, but that we actually have the discussions that make it possible to align the workflows between these different work packages, uh, research uh, groups or research institutes. And so that we do not only fill, fulfill the requirements set out, um, but also that this plan is actually applicable to the workflows of people. Uh, and that they can actually work with it and that it's useful uh, instead of just a, a checkbook exercise. And um, there are also data stewards role uh, that are a bit less advisory. So my role is primarily advisory. Um, there's different data stewards roles where people really uh, work hands-on with the data and then they can also make a huge impact in terms of uh, whether data sets are, no are not only open, uh, but also usable. Um, because we see sometimes that data sets are being shared, uh, but is that done in a manner that is also helpful? Uh, that is the question. And our data stewards can play a role. Amazing. Thank you, Esther. I really love that image of the data steward as a navigator through to the implementation of the data management plan and not just treating it as a, another piece of paperwork to um, fill in. Um, we're going to move on. I'm delighted that our final panelist, uh, Joseph, has joined us. Joseph, if you could, we'll give you a couple of minutes to introduce yourself. We have been asking our panelists to also respond to how you and your organization have been advocating for diversifying roles in research and data science. And then we'll carry on with our, our panel discussion. Thank you very much. Okay. 
famoso de Chao Kodeja, a profesor con el producto de la Joseph, could I just ask you to move a bit closer to the microphone? Oh, yes, that's better. Thank you. Are you hear me now? Yes, yeah. Okay. Uh, so, uh, what I'll say is that I am a scientist of the African Ocean Science Library here in Africa. And uh, I am uh, also, a uh, computer scientist at the moment, what we are dealing with is uh, promoting the data stewardship in such community by doing advocacy work uh, with regard to ensuring that uh, collaborations can function uh, and also ensure the research centers with regard to intellectual property issues, because when they child their data, they are afraid of uh, losing the intellectual property, and therefore we are taking them through a whole the education about this paradigm shift of open science, so that they do not just carry the other traditional mechanism into this new space, so that they are equipped with the understanding of things to do with PIDs. You know, digital object identifiers um, uh, and establishing a, a trusted research environment and communities of practice. This is exactly what we are trying to do at the moment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joseph. Really good to hear that you're, uh, you're providing a, a crash course on all the open science practices um, uh, um, in Africa. Thank you so much for joining the panel. Um, we are going to move on to panel question two. Um, and uh, I'd like to start with Sandra on this one. Uh, can I ask you just how is the professional relationship between um, responsibilities and traditional incentive systems evolving? Um, and then as an extension, what are some of the challenges you faced and your organization faced in, in addressing this sort of evolution? Yes, thank you. This is a really great question. And I, I think there are similarities between different countries, but in the UK, for example, is much further already with incentives and with the professional career path for athletes. We are still working on it in, in, in the US. So really having per institutional career path, really that it's a role that is accepted by HR, that it's accepted by the university, and even just that people are aware that this role is important. So we are still catching up on, on this and the incentives often are still the typical academic incentives, publications, and proposals of how much money comes in. It gets better. It's also accepted now more, you know, that people can take training. If they do software development, it's, yeah, at the universities, at the national labs, where, where it has the space, it starts to be, yeah, they, they need training. They need different career paths in that regard. Yeah, some want to stay really on, on the technical side. Some want to become managers of teams. So to really have the diversity there, we could see a little bit like how it developed for librarians or how it developed from the 90s where everyone was like, oh, we don't need HBC centers. Why should we have HBC centers? And then it was every university was aware of, oh, yeah, we need that. And we need the HBC administrators. And I think we are a little bit in a kind of same loop at the moment where people realize we need research software. So we need also the people who are creating it and who are taking care of, of the quality or really know what they're doing. As Neil said, maybe, you know, in the future, it is more like, oh, these are the people who are taking care of that it's really correct code, that it's, you know, that the practices are ethical, that not developing everything themselves. So I really think we are on a good way, but 
there's still also the problem with, for example, minority serving institutions often don't have the money to have these positions. So how to solve that? And I think there is more and more this idea that that there might be like an organization like USRC can help with, you know, sending from one institution some research software engineers on some funding to to another institution that they have at least access. Um, yeah, there are several levels there. Um, I, I think we are still very at the beginning in the US. There's still um, the need for more awareness. And also that I often start with faculty, I say, oh, you, you ask your PhDs or your postdocs to write code, but your research is not in software. So wouldn't it be nice <laughs> to have someone who writes with your postdoc and your PhD together the code, and they can really focus on research. That often gets them. And the other example I think that gets them is, when did you lose the last time data or code? They all lost data or code if they didn't plan for the backup. You know, it is what it is. <laughs> and then I take the example, it would be nice to have this professional who takes care of it. Uh, you know, when the PhD leaves, not all the scripts are leaving. <laughs> Think like that. Yes. So, so these are the examples for awareness that is a good way. But as I said, I, in the US, we still have to do a lot of more to get really this recognition. There are bigger institutions like Princeton, Notre Dame, who can afford that already, but it's not, and at all the universities, and there are some, you know, over thousand universities, so, and community colleges, and yeah, so it, it needs still time and work. Great, thank you very much, Sandra. Um, Joseph, the, the same question for you. How are you seeing the relationship between professional responsibilities and traditional incentives uh, evolving or changing in, um, in your sphere? Yeah, thank you very much. Hope you can hear me now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yes, so what, what we are seeing is that um, um, a need for the older practices to adjust to the new uh, paradigm shift. Uh, so what is happening is that uh, the criteria for promotion in the university has not changed. And also the funders who really determine the kind of research that is going to be done in the practices have also not adjusted their criteria by which these funds are supposed to be awarded. So we, 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 are, we are beginning to see the buy, but we need this to be mainstream to become the norm, to become the main practice. Uh, as of now, uh, we are doing a lot of advocacy, but we want to see an increasing uh, involvement of partners who are demanding that uh, we increasingly practice open science principles. So that is what is, 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 is creating hesitancy. Uh, we are trying to tackle this problem by bringing on board the young scientists, uh, the upcoming uh, researchers uh, to buy into this kind of practice and uh, offering them uh, data steward uh, courses, which are supposed to be available uh, and also encouraging the development of data management plans and uh, uh, also providing resources that are federated. Uh, for instance, we are building a, a, a communities of practice uh, to have a cloud environment and federating this environment. And when we are federating them, we are federating them with the resources that are common and usable to those communities. And so once they begin to see the value of belonging to this practice, then we are going to see more of them uh, join us. So this is where we are trying to do as incentivizing uh, so that it is their own value gain in terms of reusing this material later and also uh, using these uh, resources that they have to attract funds and also to attract collaborations that are lasting. So once this is demonstrated, this is going to be very good. As of now, we have the Data Science Without Borders project 
So this is a very good example of a Pan-African initiative and project that we think will rally the, 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 and demonstrate how uh, you can use this practice uh, to en entrench uh, open science practices and data science practices across. So this is, this, is, this is a very good step, but we want to see many of these kind of projects come to succeed so that they become a reference case for others to join. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Joseph. Um, and before we move to uh, any questions um, that people might want to share in the chat for our panelists from the folks in the audience, um, I just want to see if anybody in the panel wants to come back on those two questions um, or expand on any points um, that the other panelists have raised during the uh, during the discussion so far. Esther. Yeah, I just uh, wanted to echo the comments that Joseph made on how our institutions and funders are not changing as rapidly as these roles are being incorporated in our institutions. Um, and that's, that's not a super recent thing in the sense that I see that for educational focused roles as well. Uh, so our institutions are very much focused on researchers and what they do for the institute, whereas generally universities' missions uh, are also heavily relying on any contribu contributions to the education side of things. Um, and I think that having increasingly more roles, um, so including these research infrastructure roles, uh, but also these uh, ver very much older educational roles, lecturers, etc., um, really demonstrate that we currently have a very narrow view of what it is uh, to be academic staff or to be a researcher in, in a system. Um, and I think that any steps that we take to improve the recognition of these roles can really benefit the entire research ecosystem uh, because that would also allow researchers to focus more on, um, well, any skills or any projects that they would really like to focus on instead of what is expected of you uh, as a researcher. And I'll pass it on to other panelists. Yeah, I, I can see Neil with his hand up and we haven't had any questions in the chat. So Neil, if, you, if you'd like to come back as well and then we'll move on to closing questions and statements. Thank you. Um, yeah, just echoing what's what's the other panelists have said. I think it's interesting to see the different ways in which particularly institutions have been trying to recognize different roles. Um, if anything, in the UK, I've seen it uh, go the other way where uh, there was, a, where when I first started my career 25 years ago, there were a number of different pathways that I could take um, working at a university. And now presently, there's only, there's only basically two. Um, you can either be a, an academic or you can be in professional services. Um, but we're starting to see glimmers of that changing. And I think that's the real key thing is encouraging our institutions, because I think they are changing slower than our funders uh, to recognize that um, things like promotion criteria need to be much more varied and things like job roles need to be much more varied. All these career pathways uh, need to be diverse if we are to really establish team research, team science. Great. And Sandra, uh, last one, and then we'll move to closing. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I wanted also to add, I agree, you know, to, to all the comments that were made. And it's really the cultural change we need in academia and national labs. And um, this is slow, but we, we can, we have started. So so I think one of the bigger roles, not as Neil, also as does that the institution that funders and also Joseph, I, I think one is also to really reach the researchers themselves who feel mostly comfortable in this ecosystem because that is what they're doing, a lot of them at least. So and that's not that they don't feel comfortable to support the role, but that they see that these roles are needed. I, I think that is one of the advocacy Yes, they, they are the educators, they are the researchers. They make this research enterprise going. Great, let's help them to see that, that the other roles are really supporting their own goals. I, I think that is the academic cultural change we need. 
Great, wonderful. Uh, last two questions uh, for our speakers now. Um, this one, uh, I'll start with Neil. Uh, who else can we learn from in this uh, arena? Are there organizations and individuals outside the field of open science that we should be looking towards for inspiration? Yeah, um, so so there's obviously an, um, the, the obvious answer to this question from a research software engineering perspective, which is open source software communities. Uh, where you can see both good and bad examples of diversifying teams. I think quite a lot you can see examples of the, the principle of safety and similarity coming through where teams tend to recruit and uh, pr promote people who look like them and do things in the same way, even though there's been lots and lots of research done to show that diverse experiences are a benefit to all sorts of teams. So I think um, open source communities are a really good way of, of seeing very similar things happening. But the other example I wanted to give was around community gardens, because um, I think with the aspect of community garden, it's a space where people are brought in to, uh, to basically pass on knowledge. And I think that's a really important part of what we should be looking at in terms of diversification of roles in open science and open research is how do we pass on that knowledge? Um, and I think a community garden is a wonderful example of something where no matter what background you have, what skill level you have, there is something you can do that helps the, the overall collective. Uh, and I think that's a really great message to take forward in terms of how we do this in uh, science and research as well. Uh, Sandra, same question to you. Where where else should we be looking for inspiration? I think there are several. First of all, I agree also to Neil. Um, another, I, I think, is really there are these efforts of non-traditional communities building around academia. And we can learn, for example, from the carpentries. I mean, they're very successful. They're, they're bringing really a different way of learning around software, around data, um, yeah, to, to the community. Then community builders, like the Center of Scientific Community, CSCCE um, engagement. It's around scientific communities. How do we build this community? How do we support each other? How I, I think these, these are examples which are really good to, to bring the message of everyone forward. We have a big consortium in, in the US around research facilitators. And they're looking at these roles from HPC facilitators to really, you know, people network. Um, I, I think there are so many roles evolving. We can support each other. Even so our direct roles are different. I, I think they, these are the most examples that, that come to mind for me at the moment. Amazing, thank you very much, Sandra. Um, a different closing question to you, Joseph. Um, what is your vision for advancing open, collaborative, reproducibility and ethical standards um, in research and data science? And how do you think that a project such as the Turing Way can help with that? Oh, Joseph, I'm afraid if you're speaking, we're not able to hear you very clearly. Can you try again? Okay, well, uh, Joseph, we'll come back to you. Uh, Esther, same question to you on uh, standards and how we can leverage projects like the Turing Way in supporting those. Um, I actually think that the Turing Way is a great example of where others can not only learn about certain topics in research uh, and research processes, um, but also see what it can be to be a part of an inclusive research culture. Uh, because I think that the Turing Way is really demonstrating this. And I also really liked uh, the focus of the answers by Neil and Sandra on um, the community and what, what does a team look like? Uh, and I think traditional academia has a lot to learn uh, from these types of community uh, and to really make them more inclusive uh, to all of these different roles. 
and uh, particularly, uh, for example, how the Turing Way is sharing information um, in the sense that it's it's not separate publications that we then can still build upon, but in a lot more of a is less straightforward than how it happens in the Turing way, where anyone can just come in and build upon it and make adjustments. And after a quick review, then it's incorporated in the knowledge base, so to say. That is not how our publishing system looks like, which has also a lot of uh, gatekeeping going on, etc. Um, so I think maybe the Turing way doesn't leverage these types of things, but it's, it's really a an example of how academic research could be performed or could be uh, functioning. And I, I hope that other people take example there. Great, thanks very much, Esther. And if, Joseph. If, if Yes, I'm back. I think you can hear me now. Yes, yes, much yeah, clearer, thank you. What I would you. say, the, the Turing Institute can help us in terms of sharing the tools that they've developed through the community as you have noted, the African Open Science Platform is trying to create collaboration with other uh, communities. We've just plugged in with the Global Open Science Cloud. I've shared some link where you can see we are sharing and federating uh, resources, computing power, storage, and creating communities and standards that can be shared. We do think that what Turing in, uh, way is doing uh, we can actually extend these uh, uh, resources that they've developed, and we can also add to the same and increase the usage of the same. Uh, we can uh, uh, jointly do some uh, capacity building in terms of making sure that, uh, you know, uh, one of the, the, the lagging effects is lack of capacity to absorb. So we in academia have that opportunity and through the instruments such as the African Open Science Platform, which is regional, we can actually then uh, create a critical mass that is needed to accent practices. So that is one very strong area. We encourage the federation and the um, creating of um, open uh, research facilities. Uh, we have done that by providing a cloud environment. And that is in the sense there is a lot that we can uh, work together, and I'm very, very excited. And we're looking forward to demonstrate this through the uh, Data uh, Science Without Borders project that has just been launched last month. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much, Joseph, for closing out the formal part of uh, this um, session. Just behoves me to uh, share my screen a final time to say thank a huge thank you to the Turing Way community, a huge thank you to all of our panelists joining us from across the globe. Um, we do have some links and resources on here. You can find those in the shared notes document that we've shared in the chat. And of course, no Turing Way session would be complete without thanking our hundreds of contributors, thousands of users across the globe, without which literally none of this would be possible. Um, thank you everyone for coming today as well. And thank you to those of you who've shared um, messages in the chat and questions in the chat as well. Um, and thank you to Neil and Sandra for um, writing some answers to those because we have run out of time, unfortunately. But thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, we look forward to having future discussions on this. If you have thoughts, questions or follow-ups, the shared notepad will be open for a little bit longer. And we look forward to seeing you again at other events in the future. Have a wonderful rest of your conference.